Hey, good morning, Sozo. How are we doing this morning? Everybody doing good today? This day was specifically made by the king of the universe. And our response to it is to bring joy into the house of God, bring joy into our lives. If you're joining us online, fantastic. Welcome to you. I wanna invite anybody in the room, though. Uh, you can come up to the front if you'd like to. The reason we say to, to possibly accept that invitation is that I think it just displays passion and helps shift the atmosphere in the room a little bit. So you don't have to, but you're just invited. Know that. I've been thinking a lot about the word privilege this last week, specifically family and what being a part of a family allows you to do. There's this, uh, there's this allowance um, when, you're, when you belong in a family that you you go full full force. Uh, it, in the morning when I make breakfast for my four little boys, they're like at the table, they're saying, hey, what's for breakfast? There's this expectation because they're privileged to get to do it. And so I just wanna invite us to remember our place, that you are privileged to be children of God. And so don't let that pass you by. And so we're excited today to get to get as close to God as we wanna get, to climb up in his lap and to come after him. Let's sing about his love this morning. Hurry! 
to sing a phrase of love back to God. Because if we really believe and understand today that his love for us is as intense and wonderful as we're singing right now, then a right response for us would be to, to, to love him back. Because he first loved us, we can love. And so let's just take a moment and just put a love song out of your heart this morning. It's unrehearsed. It's sloppy as can be. And just take a second and sing love to God.
to fully praise you it will take all eternity just like Lazarus oh you brought me back to life dead things come to life. I think about when Mary and Martha sent word to Jesus and said, the one you love is sick. And Jesus said, his sickness will not lead to death. And today, I think some of you look at your circumstances and in the natural, Lazarus died. But God turned to his disciples and said, come, let's go wake our friend up. And so today in your life, as we are singing this, I think some of you in the room could say, there's parts of me that are dead. But I'm here to tell you that those things in your life that you think are dead are only sleeping. Because Jesus is walking into your place of pain, into your place of wounding, into your financial situation. And he is saying to you, son and daughter, that place that you thought would never see life again, 
I am walking into your circumstances. I'm gonna bring life, I'm gonna breathe life, and those places will live again. So today, if that's you, if you think or feel there are places in my life that are dead, I just want you to raise your hand. If you say there are places in my life, my finances, my relationships, my marriage, my emotions, my hopes, and my dreams, if you think those places are dead, I want you to raise your hand because Jesus is saying, I am walking into your situation. See, the disciples said, don't go back to that city, Jesus. That's dangerous. And what a picture of the cross that he said, the one that I love is there and he is only asleep. And so God, I thank you that you are bringing dead things to life today. I thank you that in this room and those watching online, that those places in your heart and in your life that have not seen the light of day, what you feel like for years. In Jesus' name, the breath of God is coming into you today and going to bring some things back to life. And so finances, we just speak the breath of God over you. Relationships, we speak the breath of God over you. Purpose, identity, dreams, we speak the breath of Jesus in your life. So God, I thank you that you are in the business of restoring that you are in the business of bringing life and that your breath can do more in a moment than we can do in our lifetime. So God, I thank you for healing in the room. I thank you for those that are sick in their body today, that they will experience the breath of life in Jesus' name. God, you are good. And in you, we have all that we need. And in you, the things that are dead are now alive. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Come on. Thank you, worship team. Thank you. Wow. He is good. Before you sit down, I want you to take a minute and say hello to your neighbors, someone that you haven't met before. Ask them, how long have you been attending Sozo? are finding your seat again. If this is your first time here, we just want to say welcome. Uh, we would invite you to send us a text message that says hello to the number on the screen. And we just want to reach out to you via text message and just uh, touch base. Thank you for coming. Uh, let's transition into our time of offering. And I don't know about you, but God recently has been shattering my expectations of his goodness. And I realized over the past year of my life that I have put him in a box into what his goodness must look like. That it must come financially in this form. That for me to be happy, it must look like this. For me to experience the goosebumps of his goodness, uh, it must look like this in my life. And it is like he has come in and so lovingly knocked out the recesses of my heart in those walls and said, I'm actually gonna bless you beyond your wildest imagination if you'll let me bust open the preconceived and expectations of my goodness because I'm much better than you ever could think that I am. And so today, as we're talking about giving, I was thinking about 2 Corinthians, in, uh, verse, 2 Corinthians chapter nine. It says, whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. Whoever sows generously will also reap generously. And I felt like God said, keep reading. Let me shatter that expectation, that old way of thinking, living on the wrong side of the cross when we say, I've got to do to get. And he said, no, simply it's an overflow. I do, you receive and then you give. And so if you'll look down, I love in the Passion Translation, 2 Corinthians 9, 10 through 11, it says, this generous God who supplies abundant seed for the farmer 
which becomes bread for our meals, is even more extravagant towards you. First, he supplies every need, plus more. Then he multiplies the seed as you sow it, so that the harvest of your generosity will grow. You will be abundantly enriched in every way as you give generously on every occasion. See, he is the provider and the investor to our seed. I think we I think we've got to rub some pennies together to, to come up with something financially when he said, actually, I'll give you the seed. I'm just asking that you sow it. I'm asking that you give generously. I'm asking that you water it and tend to it. And so changing my way of thinking of first I have to do to get, he's like, actually, I'll just give you what you need. Just steward my resources really well. And so today as we're talking about giving, and we have three ways to give here at Sozo, but I want you to think about that generosity from a different place of, whew, okay, I need to tithe today. Because if I tithe, then I'll get something. And it's like, actually, he's given you so much seed. What are you doing with it? How are you sowing it? Where are you putting it? Because his promise is to multiply it. That's his deal, not yours. So today, let's just pray over our offering. Uh, God, I thank you for your generous seed. I thank you that you're our investor. You're our, our seed donor. You give us everything that we need. And so God, I thank you that you're teaching us in this season how to steward the seeds well. And so, God, I just pray financial blessing over every person in this room and watching online, every Sozo family member in our region, that as we sow and water our seeds with you, God, that we are going to see a blessing and a harvest that just busts out the walls of our preconceived ideas of your goodness. And so, God, I just pray that you would uh, come in and, and create a spot in our heart to receive from you, shatter that place in our heart that was once uh, walled up with what we thought should happen. But I just pray that we would receive uh, your goodness in our life and your blessings over our life. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. So we are starting a new series, What is the Gospel? I think that's it, right, Steve? Okay. Uh, and so I'm excited to invite up our lead equipping pastor, Steve Smothers. I don't know of any better person that could kick off this series than Steve Smothers. So come on up, Steve. Thank you. How do you know we got a participatory faith? Two of you know that. We have a participatory faith. You know, all right, I'm, Natalie was preaching. She was doing good, wasn't she? I mean, God initiates, he gives, we participate. We get to receive, participate, and join him in what he's doing. I mean, that's really our faith. That's the deal. And so I'm excited about today. <clears throat> How many of you noticed the big water baptism trough out there when you came in? Isn't that great? We're gonna do baptisms here. We get to participate with God. Some of you guys are gonna be baptized. Some of you might realize you need to be baptized this morning, and the water is fine, so get ready. It's gonna be good. We also, and when you came in, you should have received one of these little cups. We get to participate at the Lord's table and the Lord's supper today, and that'll come in a little bit, so get it out there where you can uh, remind yourself of what we're doing. This series... What is the gospel? I, I don't know about you, but maybe you grew up in the church. I grew up in the church. I was a church brat. And so I heard the gospel all my life. But can I tell you, hang on for just a little bit. Do you really know what the gospel is? You know, I was, in, I was with a group of pastors just a few months ago. And one of the pastors said something like this. We were in a Pastors in Covenant group. By the way, there's some really cool stuff going on in our city with pastors all over the region that are joining together saying, I, I need you, I need you, brother. And so pastors are kind of cross-pollinating, just a safe place, not to talk doctrine or anything like that, but just to pastor each other. It's a pretty good deal, huh? So one of the guys says something like this. He says, you know, I believe, the conversation kind of turned toward unity, which I'm for unity. Are you for unity? It's a good thing. And he said, I believe that, that if, if every one of us pastors in this circle, there was about a, 
10 of us or so, he said, if every one of us really believed and shared the gospel, the result would be unity. And my first response was, amen, but I couldn't really say it. It got, you know, I didn't get it out because I had a check in my spirit. I said, God, what is that all about? I believe in unity. I believe in the gospel. I believe in what your church and what you're doing in a larger way. I believe in the kingdom. I believe all these things. And so I kind of wrestled with that for a little bit. And the Lord, a couple days later, the Lord said to me, Steve, I've got an assignment for you. The Lord ever give you an assignment? He said, here's your assignment. I want you to go to every pastor that was in that circle one-to-one. And I want you to take them to coffee. You buy the coffee. And I want you to ask them one question. And that one question is this. What is the gospel to you? He said, because listen, for unity to come, there's gotta be unity in what the gospel is. See, see, I think that's the question. I think it's a major, major question. How many of you know it really doesn't get any deeper than the gospel? It doesn't get any deeper than Jesus is Lord, okay? And so I, I was thinking, okay, so what, what does that look like? And so I'm currently in the middle of this assignment, and I will not give you the report just yet because it's a sample size, but it's interesting. One of the things the Lord said to me, he said, listen, Steve, I want you to ask the question, but you don't get to lead the witness. You don't get to say anything unless they ask you back, what do you think the gospel is? Because I want you to really hear people's hearts. I want you to really understand what's going on. Now, why does that matter? Why is that important? Why do you think I had a pause? Well, I'm glad you asked. I was reading in the book of Galatians where I usually spend a lot of regular time. And I noticed that this is Paul's first letter that he writes to the people in a region called Galatia. And it's, it's less than 20 years after the cross. And already something really, really terrible has happened to the gospel. Paul uses words like this. He says, the precious gospel has been distorted. It's been perverted. What you're preaching is a different gospel. Can I tell you that if a gospel is not about good news, it's not a gospel. Okay? Say that again. If the gospel is not about good news, it's not the gospel. And I think a lot of times we think, well, you know, we're pretty close. You know, we get there. But can I tell you what? If, if the gospel does not carry a radical grace that makes you go, oh my gosh, I could never do that. That couldn't be possible. Only God could do that. If it doesn't have that quality to it, it's not the gospel. If it's something that we can do in our own strength, it's not the gospel. The gospel is good news. The gospel is oozing with the grace and the empowering presence of God to carry out what only he can do. The Apostle Paul knew that. The Apostle Paul would write stuff like, he said, you know what, man, don't, don't get to a place where you are uh, led astray from the simplicity of pure devotion in Christ. A lot of times we, we, we try to figure things out in our own strength now, what is the gospel? Can I say that the gospel, the gospel outside of the kingdom of God makes very little sense? Let me unpack that a little bit. See, Jesus' primary message was the kingdom of God. It's a big message. Jesus is Lord of all. But his, his primary method was the gospel, was grace. Grace is within the larger context of the gospel. 
Let me say it this way. If your gospel is anything short of Jesus, you've got the wrong gospel. See, see the gospel really at its very essence is Jesus plus nothing. Okay? Let's say that together. Jesus plus nothing. It feels pretty good, doesn't it? But I'm telling you what, we are so taken by what Paul would call the elemental principles of the world that just gravitationally pull us away to try harder, to work more, to perform better, to make something happen that we lose sight of Jesus plus nothing. And that's what Paul is saying to the Galatians. Golly, you guys are jacked up. How did you get so far away from the spirit leading you to Jesus to trying to work it out in your flesh, in your own ability? Right? Is that not our our same dilemma 2,000 years removed? Is to have this kind of mixture of grace that gets us saved, but then we gotta work pretty hard to make things work out. Can I give you... Can I give you some relief this morning? Just relax. Just rest. Just say, thank you, Jesus. Because it really is not about anything we can do. It's about him living his life through us. That's the good news. The good news is, is, is a radical, radical word. It's, it's, uh, it's this opposite direction of elemental principles, as Paul called them, or as we have often talked about, living out of the tree of knowledge. There's a way that seems right to us, but it always ends in death. See, the the way that to full life is the gospel. This morning, I want to talk to you about the simplicity of the gospel. We'll look at several aspects of the gospel. Today, I want to talk about the simplicity of the gospel. gospel. Um, the, The early church was... Uh, birthed in this context, okay? Rome, the Roman Empire rules the world. The Roman Empire has between 70 and 100 million people, okay? Of that group, more than 50% of the people were slaves. Let that, that sink in your mind. 50 million people are slaves. That means they're illiterate. They can't read. They can't write. They don't understand a lot of high lofty theology, okay? So they need something very simple that will make sense that they can receive, that the children can receive, that everybody can receive, and they can pass it along because God is after our participation, okay? He wants to activate us in such a way that it becomes a generational thing. We pass it on generation to generation to generation. But there's got to be a simplicity to the gospel. So today I'm going to give you two things that are kind of the the essence of the gospel as the early church understood it. Two prophetic acts, if you will. Two object lessons. Two sacraments. The word sacrament, just think sacred moment. It's an encounter with God. And those two sacraments that most churches would agree on, some of them have more, are the Lord's Supper and water baptism. You know, it's amazing how the things uh, that are so simple can become almost blasé to us today. Can I tell you, those are the very core things of our ancient faith. There are people all over the globe that will celebrate the Lord's table today. There are people that will celebrate water baptism. And I want to talk to you a little bit about that because in those things contain the very essence of what the gospel is. So let's unpack that just just a little bit. Uh, Communion, you, you might have grown up learning all different kinds of names for communion. Paul writes about what he, what, the NIV calls the Lord's Supper in 1 Corinthians chapter 11. If you have a copy of your scriptures, turn there with me. We don't have slides for that particular passage today. But in 1 Corinthians 11, starting with verse 20, this is the first um, writing about the Lord's table. Anywhere in scripture, anywhere 
uh, that, that is known of. Paul writes it. He, he writes it. And so he's writing to the church in Corinth. And here's what he says uh, in 1 Corinthians 11, starting with verse 20. He says, so then, when you come together, is it not for the Lord's supper you eat? Stop a second. Paul is saying, we all know that the central thing that we do when we come together is remember what Jesus did for us. We eat this supper. They would actually have a meal and then they would uh, celebrate the memory of what Jesus did, just common things. You have, have a little cup here. It was probably a better deal than what we got here. This is like a little uh, snack of some sort, but, but, you know, a styrofoam snack here. But, but, but go with me, okay? They, the bread and the wine, common elements of the day. But people had, every time they would come together, they would remember what Jesus had done for them and who he was to me. He says, but, but listen to the context. This is just, this is just uh, less than 20 years away. Or, or actually, this is a, a little more than 20 years. And he says, when you are eating some of you, Go ahead with your own private suppers. As a result, one person remains hungry, another one even gets drunk. That's an interesting church meal, isn't it? He says, don't you have homes to eat and drink in or do you despise the church of God by humiliating those who have nothing? I want you to hear this. Over half the people in the Roman Empire are slaves. They don't have anything. He's talking to a people that uh, the haves and the have-nots. He's saying, listen, one of the things that really marks us as followers of Jesus is that we're a generous people, that we're a loving people, that we include the stranger, the person who's on the outside. He said, what are you guys doing? Hoarding stuff, getting drunk, all this stuff. Eat at home. When we come together, everybody gets to partake in this. How many of you, you grew up, this is a little rabbit, but I'll, I'll throw it out, grew up uh, being taught that, that communion is, is only for this select group of people. Scripture's saying this thing, the table is open for those who will say Jesus is Lord, period. It is. And he goes on, he says, now, he says, don't humiliate each other. What shall I say to you? Should I praise you? Certainly not, not in this matter. For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, he took bread. Everybody just take out your little bread here. This is a participatory faith, church. He took out, he took the bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after the supper, he took the cup, the chalice, and he said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink in remembrance of me. And whenever you eat the bread and drink the cup, proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. So then, whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an, unmanner, an unworthy manner will be guilty of sinning against the body and blood of the Lord. Everyone ought to examine themselves before they eat and drink the cup. For whoever eats and drinks without discerning the body of Christ eats and drinks judgment upon themselves. Let me ask the question, what, what, what is partaking in an unworthy manner? Can I tell you in context what it is? It's being greedy with your food and, and your wine. It's, it's um, shaming the poor. It's bringing division to the church. That's what's going on in this, in this very thing. And he goes on in verse 33, says, So then, brothers and sisters, when you gather to eat, you should all eat together. See, see this cup, this bread, it, it really is, it's, it's a picture about receiving again, the sacrificial love. 
the forgiveness, the salvation of Jesus, when we take this in, just take it in. Take it in. You're taking in the body of Jesus. Jesus said, man, you, unless you eat my flesh, you have none of me. He said, I want you to be one with me. I want, I want you to, to take me in. Remember, my goodness, like the Paschal lamb that every family had, and they filled themselves up, and they were full. They had no leftovers. They took in all of the lamb. He said, take the lamb in. Take the lamb in. Receive, receive. But it's also about remembering. He says, remember in remembrance of me, remember me. I was thinking of this, it's remembering. Some of us are, are busted up in relationship. Some of us have shamed one another or others on the outside. They say, no, no, let's remember. We're a body, we are one. We're the body of Christ. We embody Jesus everywhere we go. Let's be remembered. Let's come back together, church. Amen? Let's, 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 Let's love in the same way he loved. It's remembering, coming into union, coming into oneness, both this way with Christ and this way with one another. It's the body of Christ. But it's also, it's, it's, it's also the foretaste of the wedding supper of the Lamb. How many of you know that uh, when you say yes to Jesus, you have entered into the bride of Christ. Got one amen. Anybody else excited about that? Amen. We are part of the bride of Christ, the co-sovereign ruler of the universe. We enter into that relationship. We enter into the very triune relationship, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. We get to enter into that as the bride of Christ. We have a seat at the table. We are seated in heavenly places. We have the power of God, not only available to us, but living in and through us. And when we take of the cup, we remember there's gonna be one day where every tribe and tongue will come together in chorus to the glory of God. But guess what? Now is the foretaste to start doing it now. Start doing it now. And so let's receive the, the blood of Jesus, the new covenant blood of Jesus. And we say, thank you, Jesus. Thank you for your blood. Thank you that you are Lord. Thank you that you are my Lord, that you're my Savior. See, that's participation. That's what the early church did when they came together. It's also a time to be done regularly where we re-up. How many are married here? Okay, about 50%. Some of y'all not sure, I, I, I see. <laughs> Uh, some of you are married and, and I, I, you know, you, it's okay to raise your hand. How many, how many of you know it's a, it's a good idea to tell your spouse, I sure love you, regularly? Not just at the altar when you said I do. I do. I still do. Regularly. Re-upping. When we come to the Lord's table, that's what it is. That's what it's about. We come together to say, Lord, thank you. It reminds us of who we are. And it reminds us of whose we are. But you know, there's another, another uh, sacred moment, another uh, participation, another act, uh, pro, uh, prophetic act that, that the early church did. And that is water baptism. You know, I, I know a lot, a lot uh, uh, I, I grew up in a denomination where baptism was pretty important. But I think because some, some denominations overemphasize it to the point of saying, unless you are water baptized, you ain't gonna make it into the pearly gates. I gotta tell you, that's not what I'm saying. But what I am saying is that the early church put a premium on water baptism that I don't think the church in America does today, okay? In, in the early church, they didn't have a walk the aisle and uh, say a prayer and you're saved and if you wanna get baptized, you can or not. That wasn't the way it was done. You realize that? Repentance most often happened in the water as people make confession that Jesus is my Lord. 
You know, I was in uh, Serbia a number of years ago, <laughs> and uh, I was with uh, my good friend, one of my spiritual fathers, Robert Mearns, and, and uh, we were traveling. I'd, I'd never been to Serbia, and myself and two other guys uh, from uh, the United States. And so we, we get to uh, Novi Sad, and he just kind of dumps us off. He says, hey, listen, these guys probably need some prophetic words and ministry, and go get them. I'm thinking, what? I mean, you, you know, okay. And so, uh, and then he goes to Belgrade. And so he says, and, and so meet, meet me uh, in um, Austria in a few days. <laughs> okay, all right. So here we are. And you ever been in a place where you know nobody and you're feeling very uncomfortable and you're just hoping that something familiar will show up? Anybody? We've all been there, right? And so I'm with, this, I'm with this guy from Virginia and this guy from um, North, North Carolina. And, um, you know, none of us extremely prophetic, you know. <laughs> so we're supposed to just get up and do the stuff, you know. We're like, we don't know anybody. And as I walk in, I hear this loud, familiar voice. Now, I know nobody in Serbia except one guy, Dushan. Dushan. Big Dushan walks in, and I'm thinking, I've only met this guy one time in Wimberley, Texas. And Dushan comes in, Steve, and he hugs me and picks me up off the ground, you know, a couple of four times, you know, I'm like, okay. And so, but there was something in me that went, wow, God, you, you really do see me. This is going to be all right. And I remember Dushan telling a story while we were there. It was before we were going to do the evening service. He had a class. He was teaching a, a school. And he was telling about water baptism. And um, no, I, I take it back. Actually, it was a different, different setting than that. He was talking, we were talking about the size of his congregation. I said, well, how many do you have in your in your church, and I'm looking around, and I see a lot of people, and he says, we have 20. I said, 20? I'm counting about 60 here. He says, we have 20. I said, what, what do you mean? You know, so we had this, he said, here's how it works in Serbia. Until a person is water baptized, they're no threat to the government. Nobody checks them out. And they're really not even considered a part of the church until they publicly declare, Jesus is my law, my Lord. They're not just people that are on the peripheral anymore, just kind of, you know, dipping their toe in. And I'll never forget that because I thought, you know what? There's something about stepping in and saying, Jesus, I'm making this announcement to heaven that Jesus is my Lord. I'm making this announcement to the church, I'm all in. I'm part of the body of Christ, the, the bride of Christ. I'm making an announcement to the devil, you can stay in hell because I'm finished with you. I don't belong to you at all. And I'm making a, an announcement to all of my family, my friends, my people that are looking on that I'm burying my old man in the water, deep in the water. We're burying him, and I'm raised to a new life in Christ. You know, in just a few minutes, that's what we're gonna do. We're gonna, we're gonna go out there, and there's gonna be a group of people that are gonna tell not only you, not only the world, but the very angels in heaven, the King of kings, the Lord of lords, the demons of darkness, I belong to Jesus. And there's some here that you might say, well, you know, I've never done that, but I never saw I need to do that. Ask the Lord what he wants for you. Because can I, can I tell you ahead of time? He wants a whole heart. He wants you all in. And so uh, a lot of times, the very thing that keeps us from being fully free is that we just haven't buried that old man and he makes way too many appearances. You know, if, if you want to walk in freedom, a lot of times one of the greatest things is, is to, to cut off the old man, disattach him, bury him once and for all. Amen? Amen. All right. Well, let me, let's look at a scripture here. We ought to, probably ought to read the Bible here and make this official. 
Uh, let's look at, at Romans chapter six. Romans six. I, gosh, what a powerful, powerful passage. The whole deal. Paul, Paul's saying, you, you guys don't have a clue of the power that you have. You have no idea what it means to be co-crucified with Christ, to be co-resurrected with Christ, to bury your old man. Listen to what he says. Or don't you know that all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were therefore buried with him through baptism into death in order that just as Christ, just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too will be raised from the dead to the glory of the Father to a new life. Uh, we, we had a, a class, uh, for a kind of a pre-baptism class earlier this morning, and I said, you know, the truth is Christian life is really not that difficult. It's really not that hard. It's impossible. It's beyond hard. It's beyond difficult. It's impossible. How many of you would testify to that? Trying to live the Christian life in my own strength, on my own, is impossible. It's impossible. You know why it's impossible? Because it's that perverted, uh, distorted, different gospel that Paul's talking about. Trying to do it in my own strength with a Jesus band-aid is not the gospel. Trying to be a good person, throwing a five in the plate, doing some good deeds is not the gospel. The gospel is total surrender and saying, Jesus, if you don't come through, some of you know exactly what I'm gonna say. I'm not gonna make it. I can't make it if you don't come through. And at that point, it releases his grace. See, see it's not, we, we don't even have the ability to choose Jesus. He reveals himself to us. And in response to his revelation, we shift our whole way of thinking. He, we don't even change our own way of thinking. He changes. It's his kindness that leads us to repent, to change our way of thinking. All we do is just, I'll have some more, please. That's all we do. That's the Christian life. Yes, I'll take some more. Thank you, sir. That's it. If you're here this morning and you'd say, oh, I just need some more. I need, I need some. I've been trying to do this on my own and uh, it not worked out so good. Can I tell you what? If you'll come to him and humble yourself and say, Lord Jesus, I surrender all. You remember that old song? I grew up in a church that we sang it regularly. All to Jesus I surrender. All to him I freely give. I will ever love and trust him in his presence. Daily live. I surrender all. How many of you have just really thought about those words in the context of the new covenant, in the context of the spirit-filled life? See, that's, that's what God's saying. Surrender all. Surrender all. I have a, um, the, sa the same guy who dumped me off in uh, Serbia, uh, Robert Murns. He, he, he used to say this to me. He said, Steve, doing it is doing it. And I'd go, okay, that's good, Robert. He, he goes, no, no, you don't understand. Talking about it is not doing, doing it. Preaching it is not doing it. Praying about it is not doing it. Doing it is doing it. And I think, I think that there's some of us here today that we're, we're jammed full with a lot of understanding and the Lord's word to us today is doing it is doing it. What, what is it that he's saying? Step into it, surrender into it. That's doing it. There's, there's some of you that here today the Lord wants to heal but you've got to get out of your seat and, and say, I'll take some more, please. Okay? And so th this morning, we're, we're gonna, I'm going to invite our uh, folks that are going to be water baptized.
to, to go and change there in the back rooms. I'm gonna ask our worship team to, to go ahead and make your way forward. And I, I just wanna say that sometimes we make things much, much more difficult than they are. How many, how many of you know that Jesus has already finished the hard work? He's already done the heavy lifting. God was in Christ reconciling the entire cosmos, not counting man's sins against them. That's really, really good news. We don't have to get cleaned up, get worked up. All we have to do is say, I receive your love. That's right. I think that's a strong amen right there. Doing it is doing it. What's God telling you you need to do today? I'm gonna just pray for us and our team will come up. I'm gonna invite our worship team, I mean our, our prayer teams to come forward. And if, if, as the Lord has spoken to you today, I encourage you to step into what God is speaking for you, to you. Let's stand together. Holy Spirit, we thank you for your presence here with us this morning. We thank you that it's your kindness, Lord, that that gives us the capacity to repent and to, to embrace you, to take sides with you. Father, we thank you that your power is present for healing, for freedom, deliverance, for salvation. If you're here this morning and you've never said yes to Jesus, his Lord and Savior, I invite you to come forward and to make that acknowledgement, to make that proclamation. If you're here this morning and you've, the Lord, you, you know you need to be water baptized, I encourage you to step into that this morning. So Lord, we just say, apart from you, God, we can do nothing. We receive you and we say we'll have some more in Jesus' name.
you for the cross. Thank you for your life. Nothing stronger than your blood. Nothing greater than the name of Jesus And all the honor and all the power Is all the glory to the name of Jesus There's nothing stronger, there's nothing higher Amen. How many of you know the cross really does have the final word? When Jesus was on the cross, he breathed his last breath and he said this. He said, to tell us die, it is finished. And when Jesus said that, what he was saying is that there is no more dividing line between God and humanity, that he's made a way, that he's dealt with sin, that he's dealt with the devil, that he's dealt with sickness, and that he's bringing salvation. This morning, just before we, we wrap up, we'll head out in a minute and uh, all participate with baptisms and, and cheer people on, celebrate what God's doing. But I, I, I wanna not leave and miss this opportunity. I just felt like this morning there are some people that if you're just to be really honest, you have not felt like yourself. You probably said that like, I just don't feel like myself. Like my thinking isn't, isn't clear. I, I'm, I'm maybe even just wrestling with suicidal thoughts or, or self-harm. I just, I'm, I'm hearing like voices that are, that are not my own, that are really just messing with me. I feel like this weight, this heaviness. If that's you, would you be courageous enough just to raise your hand? There's a, a couple. Keep your hand up for a second. If, if you see somebody around you with their hand up, I just wanna pray together for them. Would you just put your hands on them? It's okay. Like we're, we're all, we all go through difficult times. There's some folks over here that could use a, a hand on them. And I really felt like this, that 
You see, the enemy wants to oppress you. He wants to push you down and keep you from stepping into what God has for you. And I feel like God wants to bring you freedom. And we know this, that the cross has the final word, that the blood of Jesus is enough. And so let's just pray together for these folks. Lord, I thank you, Jesus, that you have the final word, that you have said it is finished and that the enemy has no claim. And so we just, in the name of Jesus, we rebuke the enemy, we silence the accuser, we tell every demonic voice to be silenced and to go in the name of Jesus. And I just declare the shalom of heaven over your life, over your mind, over your spirit, the peace of God guarding your heart and your mind in Christ Jesus. Just rebuke the enemy. Jesus' name, just declare over you that you're loved by God, that you belong to Jesus, that you're his, that you have the mind of Christ, that the peace of God rules your heart and your mind. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. I got a, a, a few announcements uh, that I want to leave you with. Actually, go ahead and grab out your phone because you're, you're going to want to be able to put these down so that you can know uh, what's going on, how, how to step into them. While you're doing that, I want to tell you about next steps. How many of you know that Jesus didn't die so that we could have services in church, but he actually died and he rose again so that we would be the people of God that would bring transformation to the world around us? For us as a church family, it's our desire that we would see the kingdom of heaven advance to the very ends of the earth. What that looks like is that each one of us would know where God, how God has wired us, how he's called us, what he's called us into, and that we would bring his kingdom everywhere that we go. If you're interested in living that way, I wanna invite you to our next steps uh, launch. It'll be the next uh, two Sundays, um, the first two in April. And uh, we wanna let you know a little bit about who we are as a people, but we also want to walk with you in discovering God's call on your life and how you can play a part in what he's doing in this church family and, uh, and in the world around you. And so I wanna invite you to be a part of Next Steps uh, Lunch. Those uh, classes um, are two Sundays, uh, the first two Sundays of the month. And in those, um, we'll feed you lunch and we'll let you know a little bit more about Sozo and we'll do some discovery with you. Um, the next thing I wanna tell you about is the Easter Door Hanger Blitz. Anybody wanna be a part of a blitz? That sounds fun to me. How many of you know that our area is growing like crazy? that there are people moving here um, that need to know about Jesus. There are other people moving here that need a church family to belong to. And so what we wanna do next Saturday at 9.30, we're gonna gather together and then we're going to put uh, door hanger invites um, on houses in new subdivisions in San Marcos. We just wanna let people know that we're here and that they're invited to join us Easter Sunday. That is like the best Sunday ever to invite people to. And so I wanna encourage you to invite uh, your friends, your family, people that don't know God, invite them um, to join us for Easter Sunday. But we wanna go ahead and also just invite our city to come and worship uh, with us that morning. And so what we're going to do um, April 2nd, this coming Saturday, we're gonna meet at Solid Rock Church in their parking lot at 9.30, and then we're gonna divide up into teams. We've got 2,500 door hangers that we wanna hand out. And so if you wanna jump in with us, we're gonna pray uh, for the neighborhoods that we're in as we go. If we get the chance to pray for people and bless them, we'll take that opportunity. Um, but I invite you to be there, bring your kids. It should be a really fun time uh, just to, to serve uh, alongside each other. So I wanna invite you uh, to that. Also, I wanna let you know about a, uh, a new initiative that we're doing. It's called Sozo Equip. Say Sozo Equip. Sozo. We're gonna, uh, starting in April, on April 6th, we're from 6.30 to 8 at our church offices. We're gonna have a class, an equipping class, um, really just for people that wanna go deeper with God. And so this first uh, four-week class is called Foundations, and it's really uh, for anybody just wanting to go deeper with God. Um, and then we're gonna do one on uh, Living on Mission um, in May. And we just want our church family, we feel like God has called us to be a well-equipped people. And so um, I just invite you uh, to participate in that if you're free 
on uh, Tuesday evenings. Um, that's going to be awesome. Finally, as you walked in, you probably saw uh, a table uh, with some young folks uh, selling you tickets for a barbecue lunch. Our good friends uh, at Hayes County Barbecue are partnering with us for a fundraiser um, in a couple of weeks. And so you can uh, pre-buy uh, your barbecue plate um, from them. How many of you know that, uh, that um, Hayes County Barbecue is... Uh, in Texas Monthly as one of the top 50 places annually. These guys uh, are awesome. They cook really good food. And so uh, what we're going to do is have uh, some plates that you can buy. You can eat them here in a couple Sundays or you can take them with you. And uh, those are going to support our youth going uh, on a youth camp this summer. We want to bring the cost down so it makes it affordable uh, for families as much as we can. And so you can buy a plate or 10 from them. Um, and you'll get food after church, so you don't have to worry about that, and it'll also go to a really good cause. Finally, um, we are going to head outside to baptisms. If you need to, uh, if you've got kids, go grab your kids and bring them back up here. Um, they, uh, the kids are coming up this way. Oh, awesome. You don't have to grab your kids. Once they get here, find them, because our children's team, which is incredible, they are done watching your kids once they get up here. And so your kids may run wild over this couple hundred acre campus if you don't get your kids and keep them with you. Um, but we want to uh, celebrate as a church family what God is doing in people's lives. So I invite you to stay after just for uh, a little bit as we do that. Um, and we're, we're going to uh, have some baptism. So y'all can go ahead and head out those doors and we'll gather around the trough out there. Thank you for being here. Have a wonderful week.